Hello. Today we are doing the Rising Lotus Tapestry Kit. Um, I'm going to be showing you a type of square stitch, kind of my version of doing it, which I've come to call cookie stitch. So square stitch is when all of your beads are sitting like in nice little rows evenly in each direction. Traditionally, square stitch, you start with your long row and you add by going lengthwise. I prefer to work on my short rows. So I'm going to show you um, how I do this called cookie stitch. If you have uh, one of the other kits that I do that um, uses the square stitch or cookie stitch, you can use this video as well for the basic stitch idea. But um, this, this video is kind of particular to the Rising Lotus Tapestry Kits, which there are a bunch of different colors of. So step one, we're tying on to our finding. If you have purchased the kit, your findings are already together attached when you receive it. So we've done just a little knot on one side of the finding. Now I'm going to thread my needle. Oh yeah, so you're using the threads when you get your kit. Ew. When you get your kit, there'll be woven threads and fringe threads. The woven threads are quite a bit longer. They're for this whole woven section. The fringe threads are quite short. Um, threading your needle. I like to pull my thread between my thumb and my forefinger. I pinch it in there, take the eye of the needle, and push it down on top of my thread. Because I'm in my late 40s, people, and I've got readers on. We're doing all the things to try and make it easy here. So step one was tying on to your finding. And we are going to continue from here. So this is what is, I normally call this the foundation row. So we're starting with two beads because our foundation row on this particular kit is just one bead deep. So on some of the kits, you're going to find that I start with four beads because the foundation row is two beads deep, meaning two beads this way. This is not. This is one bead deep. So I went around my finding. I hid my tail up through this first bead just by pushing it with my little fingers. Not my baby fingers. I pushed it with my fingers. If you've not watched my videos before, this is this is how it goes. So I've gone up through my second bead. And we're going to pull snug. So when you're doing foundation row on most of my kits, you want snug tension. And my patterns do say what kind of tension uh, I would like you to have as you go. This one, this step is snug because you want it to be nice and snug up against your finding. So I've added one more bead. I've looped around my finding and now I'm going back up through the bead. So you can see the idea here is that you are anchoring your beads on your finding, right? So you're taking a bead. I find it easiest to keep this pushed up against my finger, my finding pull my needle around through the finding, pull the thread through, and now loop my thread back through there. Go in the opposite direction that the previous thread was. We're doing a loop, a loop. So we're doing another one. You're just continuing the length of this. I believe this particular kit is nine beads wide across our foundation row. And of course our subsequent, subsequent rows. So this is step one. In your kit or in your pattern, I'm just going to keep talking as I'm adding here, um, you will have two sheets of step-by-step -step instructions with little diagrams and you will have one sheet with the color coded pattern on there for your particular kit that you purchased. So I currently, as I'm sitting here, have the color coded pattern staring at me. And then I have the step by step. Some people ask, why don't I 
uh, conserve paper and print them back to front because you can't look at both at the same time if you do that. So they're separate sheets of paper. Last one. So that is our last little foundation guy. You can see them all sitting there. I want to scooch them just a little bit towards this side so that they're sitting all nice and evenly. Okay, so that is the end of steps one through three. We're now at the end of that. So your next step, step four says, start row with six beads. And it's because you're going to have three here and three here next to each other. So when you look at the center section of your color map, you're going to see that next step shows the separated beads, it shows you what you're going to add for that row. So you're doing oh, some are sticking to my hands. So in this particular one, we're doing one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Those are the beads that we're picking up, which are all the same color, which makes this a lot easier. So throughout this entire kit, you want to make sure you're looking at the front side of your beads. So I'm looking at the hook is facing up because that will create the seams in the same spot as you go. So I've gone up through my second bead here. Okay. Now I'm going to go back through the first bead and those three new beads. I'm pinching them with my finger to keep them tight together and help them line up. And then I'm going to go back down through this second set of three beads and that second foundation bead again. Now for my next one, I go up through the next bead because we need to start that next row. So you don't want to pull your cookie stitch, square stitch too tight. You want to make sure it's a little bit you want it snug, but not tight, okay? Because if you pull it too tight, they're going to start crowding each other and trying to find the space of least resistance. So because these are square beads, they're all going to start sitting at angles. So you want them to be able to sit nice. So you're just pulling them a little snug, not too tight. You can adjust this as you go within a row or two, but then it's going to start to kind of set where it wants. So I've added three beads. That's my next three in this pattern. I'm going to go down through the last three in the foundation row that I just added, okay? And you can see they kind of click into place there. The really satisfying thing about beading with cylinder beads, which is what these very squared off looking beads are, is that they click into place when doing stitches like peyote stitch or the uh, square stitch because they sit so nicely next to each other. They can do that when you're doing it with brick stitch as well, but I'm telling you, peyote, oh, so satisfying when they click together. So you can see them starting to line up. They're not going to be perfect. Don't worry. You're going to see these ones start to kind of move around a bit. They'll do that until you keep building your rows. Okay. So don't panic. So we added our little second row of three. We've gone around our loop and now we're going to go back down. So you're basically creating a clockwise loop, a counterclockwise loop, a clockwise loop, a counterclockwise loop, which as the threads pull against each other helps all your little beads line up because it's getting pulled from the left and pulled from the right along the top and along the bottom. So you want to keep doing your loops, looping through the previous beads, and then making sure your thread comes out of the next foundation bead ready to go. That's where we're at this one, right? So now we're adding three. Am I doing the right ones? Nope. See, sometimes I talk too much. <laughs> Everybody that has seen my videos will tell you that. So this particular set that I'm doing now has a different bead color on the end there, which happens all the time to all of us where we get a little distracted. Okay. So now I'm going back up through them again 
And in this particular direction, I'm going to be coming out the top ready for our next beads. So you saw I just pulled a little bit towards the last beads I did and this way so that they're beginning to line up. So now we're back to three of the same color. Going down through my foundation bead. Up through the next bead. Up through the last beads, I should say. And down through the newest beads. Now, yes, my tail is kind of in the way, but I want to bury it in one more row of beads before I trim it. Um, don't panic about where you trim it. You can trim it a little later. You can trim it sooner. Whenever you want, I usually like bury it in a row or two of beads. Okay, so I'm looping around, adding my beads down through the last row to anchor through my foundation row. Back up through my beads. I like to pinch between my fingers while I'm getting them all lined up. If you've seen my other videos, you will have heard me say you are in charge of the beads. You are. You're in charge of them. You tell them where to go. You adjust your thread tension. You adjust the placement of them before you pull thread too tight. And then they sit a little wonky. And as you get used to the different stitches, you will get used to how tight you should be pulling or how not tight you should be pulling, which is what I do try and describe in the videos or show, tell, write on your, on your lists, on your step-by-steps. Okay, so this particular row has that little tail on there. I'm adding my three to my thread, getting them down close to the bottom. And I'm going to, they did not slide up there. In fact, I just noticed one of my beads is still on my needle. Okay. You're in charge of the beads, so you are going to put the little tail up through there. Okay. Tail up through the beads. Push them down. And now I'm going to anchor through the previous row. I'm still looking at the front side. Why it's important to always keep looking at the same side of your work in this particular stitch is so that your seams keep going the same direction. They keep coming to the same side of your work. Okay, so I'm not going to cut that yet because I don't want to accidentally cut my thread because that would really suck. So, because we're at the beginning of a row, we're starting with six beads because you're always starting with the two first sets, right? And then you're adding three after each on this particular one. So, we're going to look at our pattern. Our pattern shows all the same color. Got it? So, you're only going through the first bead. You're using the first bead in the previous row as your foundation. Okay, so that is the key to this particular like cookie stitch, have it look the way you want it to look situation here. And you're going to go back up through just the first bead in the previous one. And add those three new beads that we had, right? Okay. Pinching between my fingers to kind of tell them who's boss. The tail looks like it's in there. It's not. The tail is like just sitting off to the side. So now I'm going to go back down through the three I just added. The most recent three. Back down through one from the previous row. So all the way across this row and all your future rows, you're only using this first bead all along here to anchor to. So now I'm coming back back down through that one. Not too tight, just a little snug. And I usually test my edges by being able to pull my needle through the thread bridge there, okay? I'm gonna add my next three beads per my pattern. Go down through, don't forget just that one from the previous row. Don't panic when you see this little thread popping out there. That's just fine. 
it's going to pull tight, right? And back up. Now, if we can count, there's an extra bead. Okay, so this is good. You get to see. We all make mistakes. Do not stick your needle back through your work to try and fix this. You're going to pull your thread off of your needle. You don't want to be piercing your thread too many times because that's what's going to cause some fraying and weakness. So I need to get the extra bead out of here. So I'm just going to pull on one of the beads to get the thread going back the other direction. I'm going to pull my thread back through all of my work. So I added too many beads. I added four. We only wanted three. Somebody came for the party that was not invited. And if you've ever had that happen, it's usually the person you want to have go home. Okay, so now we're re... <laughs> I get off track. Um, we're re-threading our needle. I'm not saying the extra person at a party is always a bad idea. It really depends on how they got there, who brought them. This person invited themselves. This bead invited itself. Let's stop calling it a person because it's not. Okay, so now we're back to three beads. We're going through the foundation bead in the previous row and back up through the beads we just added with no party crashes. <laughs> okay, now that I've got that, I'm just going to trim this little tail so that he doesn't keep getting in my way. So I'm hanging on to him, I'm pulling on him tightly and I'm pushing my scissors towards my work just to make sure I cut it nice and close. All right. So as you gather, I'm making sure I'm looking at the front side of my work. I'm looking at my pattern in this step. I'm coming from the top side. So I need to do two of this color and one of that color through one bead in the previous row. We're going to loop around. Are you guys getting the idea? I hope you're getting the idea. So the way that this particular cookie stitch is going, I'm going back down through, right? Keep looping around. The way that this particular cookie stitch is going, my seams are going to be every three beads when you actually look at the finished piece. So like you see in here, every three beads, there's a seam, right? Do, do, do. We're going to put him off to the side. So at this point, um, as long as you've gotten the idea down of how this pattern goes, it just kind of, yeah, keep repeating the circles each direction. One direction one way, the other direction for the next one. One direction one way, the other direction for the next one. Oh, see, I almost went up the wrong one. It's nice and slow and steady, this cookie stitch. Again, you don't want to pull too tight because the tighter you pull, the more these beads are going to be kind of trying to find the path of least resistance, which is not going to be where you want it to sit in this particular kind of stitch. Some people may be beading this way. That's fine as long as you're still looking at the top of your work because this is the direction that the pattern is looking at. Some people, myself included, find it easier to, to have my beadwork facing this way so that my new beads are kind of stacking this way. So I'm just going to show you something. When I'm going through here, it's feeling a little tight, but that's okay because this is the last time we're going through all of these beads together. And if it feels a little snug, you're going to just twist your needle a little as you're coming out. And that will help. Okay. So you got the idea so far. I'm going to let this bad boy start fast forwarding through the rest of it because I promise you you do not want to hear me yatter for the next half hour or however long it takes each of us to be 
beating the length of the tapestry piece. Yes, I know it's not sitting there. There it is, the length of this tapestry piece. So I'm going to meet you on your sheet work. I'm going to meet you at the end of sheet one, which is going to be at the bottom there. Okay, on your pattern, you're going to notice the very last row on your grid for this woven section only is too deep. We've been doing three deep this whole way, other than our foundation row. And now this one's only too deep, and that's to make sure that our seam keeps staying at three beads apart. So just a little note, if you're looking at your chart and you're having a little like, uh-oh, what's happening there? That's to be able to keep that seam three beads apart, right? Because we're we're putting our seam under that first bead on the previous row. So it'll look like this bead and the two that we add kind of are all sitting together. That's the fun part about all these stitches that you're learning is the thread work is kind of part of the art, right? Where, where's that going to be sitting? What's that going to look like um, when I'm done my piece? Because in a lot of the beadwork, you're going to see your thread. So what does that look like to you? Like the reason why I didn't use black thread in this is because in this section, that would be really obvious. And I don't, I personally don't think that's what I want my piece to look like. So when I'm doing patterns for you guys, that's part of the consideration is what color thread we're using, where it's sitting, things like that. So something for you guys to learn as you're going is where your thread is sitting is, is as much part of the artwork of beadwork, bead weaving, as the type of stitch you use to get that look you want with the beads, right? Just like the beads are part of the art. The thread can be as well, which is really cool because there's colored thread out there. And for some of the, um, you know, kits that you may do or things you may create yourself, that's something to consider is how much of the thread am I seeing and what, what do I want that to look like? How do I want that to translate in my finished piece? Which is kind of cool. Okay, we're getting down to the very end here. Um, adding my last couple beads, and you can tell because I'm getting near the end of my thread. All of your threads are pre-measured in your kits, and there's always extra in your kit as well, so don't have a panic, which is what we all try not to do. So the last little bit I'm doing, we're going to loop around an extra time. So that's the end of our woven section. So just like it says on step, step seven, no, the last step, final step in your woven section, you're gonna be hiding your thread. It really is just uh, arbitrary where you're going to choose to hide your thread. You're going to see in the little picture like looping arrows and little X's. Little X's the knot. I usually try and um, knot onto a thread bridge, which means just going under it. Go back through that loop as a little hitch and then keep going up through my beadwork. I don't want to pierce my thread again, so we're going to and get my needle back into the beads and keep going up through my beadwork. Being careful not to force. And then sometimes it's good to do a little loop around. Actually, I'll do it a little farther up. 
So what I'm doing is going to loop the thread around on itself, meaning just past itself, doing a little circle. I'm trying to line up my thread with my seams so that um, you don't accidentally show an additional seam on here. So I've done a knot, I've wrapped it around back on itself, and now I've taken my little needle off and I'm gonna cut this. <laughs> so there's our little woven section with our cylinder beads looking all good. And now we're gonna do the fringe, sec fringe section. Um, pretty straightforward if you've done fringe on other pieces before, it's gonna look pretty much the same. So I'm just pouring my round beads out of the container. Uh, you guys will have them in a separate little dewy with you. Huh, maybe I'll do. Nope. I'm going to stick with the, the color I had. So you have thread there for this woven section. I'm just going to quickly measure mine out. One, two, three. Oh, <laughs> that little dish holds my little reject beads because no, no beads are perfect. It's okay to keep some imperfect ones in your work, but sometimes they are just too jacked up to put in here. So we're going to bury our thread to begin. Now on this part, I will be looking at the back side of my work. Um, yeah, you can, I would look at the back side because you want to see where you're putting your seam. So we just hid our thread up this side, but we, we hit it one row in. So if you're worried about that, keep it in mind when you're tying your knot. We knew we tied our knot somewhere in here. So I'm going to go up a little farther to begin. And I'm going to tie my knot right there. So I have just a, a little tail to worry about. I'm going to go around that thread bridge. You can see the little thread bridge there. I'm going to go around it and anchor onto it and often when I'm doing fringe and I'm anchoring this way I do it twice I'll anchor twice before I actually start my um, fringiness so I'm going to do another one right there And this little thread bridge. And I should be able to pull on this and nothing's moving. My thread isn't like traveling through the beads where I just anchored it. So we know we're good to go. So this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you have a separate fringe pattern on your on your paperwork there piece. I don't know what I was gonna say. It's it's kind of repetitive. So we're doing seven seed beads, delicate bead, seed bead. Oh, just ignore the dishes getting done in the kitchen. <laughs> Things are getting thrown around. It's all good. So the round seed beads so we're looking at the back side of our work right the back side of the earring we're going up two beads to anchor because that's going to line up with where our seam is on the other side from adding these two beads so seed beads are wider than delica beads or or any cylinder beads cylinder bead size 11 and seed bead size 11 are not the same dimensions width wise. Um, Mayuki Delicas and Mayuki Rounds are about the same size depth wise, but they are not the same size width wise. Just keep that in mind. So I did this intentionally with this pattern because I wanted the fringe to feel full. I didn't want it to feel stiff and I didn't want it to feel um, 
kind of light when it's not that long. So it was an intentional design thing for me to switch to round beads at the bottom and do a bit of texture with these uh, seed beads. When you're doing fringe, you skip the bottom bead to be able to use that as an anchor. Sorry, I didn't say that on the first one. It does say that on your pattern. Um, and if you've done fringe before, you likely have done that where you leave your bottom one as your, your anchor. I'm going to turn my piece around here so I can get in there. So I'm kind of pushing up with my finger at the back so that I can push my needle through there. Roll my little fringes through my fingers to make sure that they're not getting too tight and too kinked up. Seven beads. And then we're going to use a few of the Delicos. It's a little texture difference as we go to the bottom of our fringe. A little pop of color that matches our piece. How did you guys like that kit? I love it. I love bead weaving when it uh, creates this kind of fabric-y feel. Pouty Stitch does that. Square Stitch does that. Depending on the size of your Brick Stitch piece, it does that as well. So you're just going to keep going through your fringe here. I'm going to just fast forward till we get to the end of the fringe. When you're doing your fringe, I pull this snug and I roll them between my fingers on my mat. Um, they are going to start to crowd, which is part of the design. That's totally fine. So don't panic about that. Okay, it's going to fast forward until you get to the very last fringy now. Okay, 
So we're adding our last little buddy. And then all we have to do after that is bury our tail and we are on to the next one, which you're going to do by yourself. I'm not going to go and do a whole second one with you because guess what? It went just like the first one. So we're going up through just the two just to kind of make sure we're happy with how the fringe is sitting. We're happy with how everybody looks. We got them all pulled together here. And then we are going to bury our thread. So very similarly how you did this on the other one, but I'm going to do a little hitch right off the bat so it's nice and close to the tail or nice and close to our fringes you can do them wherever you feel comfortable doing it sometimes you'll notice it's a little harder to get your needle around one of them do not keep pushing if you're having a hard time unless you know what you're doing and you feel comfortable so I did a little hitch we're going to make sure he doesn't get caught around that little finger. I'm going to loop back on itself. My hands are sweating. Back up through here. And then we are and guess what? Just repeat that for the other side. I hope you've had fun. This is my version of square stitch, which is cookie stitch, I call it. I don't know why, I just do. I mean, I do know why. It's because it looks like a bunch of little delicious rows of cookies in a cookie container, which I really try not to eat, but it happens because they're delicious. All right. I hope you had fun. Um, this particular kit is the Rising Lotus Tapestry Earring Kit. There's four colorways. Currently, there's three. This fourth one will be hitting the shop pretty quick. I hope you've had a fun time creating this. And if you have questions, feel free to send them to me through your purchase in my Etsy shop. Have a good day.